Welcome to Double XL's Inside Track, a podcast that shines a spotlight on some of hip hop's most influential industry executives, entrepreneurs, and more. I'm Vanessa Satin, editor in chief of Double XL. Join me and my esteemed co host, music executive Courtney Lowry, as we hold in depth conversations with the legendary figures that run the hip hop community. We'll discuss their journey and daily grind, their contribution to the culture, the intricacies of their jobs, plus the ins and outs of the music genre that unites us all. This is Double XL's Inside Track. Hi, I'm Vanessa Satin, editor in chief of XXL. We're here for Inside Track podcast with my co host, Courtney Lowry. Um, and we have our special guest, Sherry Bryant, who's the co president of Rock Nation, the label. And we're here to talk a little bit about uh, the hip hop industry and her illustrious career and whatnot. Courtney, I'm passing it over to you to Absolutely. get started. Welcome, Sherry. Thank, thank you. Thank you for stepping in and thank you for being with us today. Of course, thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So you've been a pillar um, for a very long time in this uh, game. Tell us how you uh, got started, because you got started at a very young age. I got started at a very young age, right. yes. Um, I started at 16 yeah. years old. I feel like the story gets boring, but I'm like, <laughs> you would think that I, you know, no one, everyone hasn't heard the story. But um, I got started at 16 years old. I grew up in Harlem, 1199. And I was fortunate enough uh, to grow up with Damon Dash. He was older than me, obviously, uh, but my mom was friends with him. And I would watch him. He uh, first had original flavor, I want to say. And then I would see Jay come around. And this was like very beginning years, right? And Damon would be 11 and I was very community oriented Mm -hmm. and so I would you know we would see him outside uh and then we just started seeing like the growth of Damon Dash like in front of our eyes you know growing up in 1199 and long story short let me skip you know one day I asked him I said could I intern with you and I was like in my last year of high school, I want to say it was the summer before me going to my last year of high school. So I was actually 15 going about to be 16. Mm-hmm. And he, um, he said, sure, come down to the office. And that was in 1999. And I started interning then. Wow, 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 wow. I started in Trinity in 98, so I really? know what you mean. Yeah. It was, a, you know, right out of uh, high school, and uh-huh. you, you get an internship, and you just keep working. It yes. never kind of, right. you know, goes into the next thing and the next thing, and then before you know it, like, uh, hip-hop becomes your college experience. It really yeah. was. Yeah. I went to college, so Damon forced me to stay in school. Damon and my family, I want to say, but once I got into Rockefeller, I knew I didn't, I was like, this is what I want to do, right? right? right, right. Um, but I had to graduate. So I actually graduated from college while interning. Where'd you go? Then nice. working. Um, I went to John Jay College of mm-hmm. Criminal Justice. And what's your so major? It was uh, government, okay. and political science, really, that's kind of like what it was called. Um, but it was in close proximity to the office. So gotcha. I would go to the office, go to the class, then come back to the office. So I did a lot of running around during that time. Now, we look back now and we see a lot of nostalgia back then. Did you know that you were living in history and that this would become major moments that marked a moment in time? No way. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I knew that it just was exciting. I was a fan of music, you know, like I would say during my earlier years before I got there, which was not, you know, I didn't have that many years, right? Because I was started at 16. (laughs) But um, I I used to watch music videos all day. I was so enamored in the, like, just music that's and it right. was mainly hip-hop and r&b because that's what my mom used to play as i you know growing up in the house or in the car so i was just excited to be a part of what was going on because right. i didn't realize there was such a business behind it right i was mm-hmm. just ex- it know, was growing fan. the business was growing yeah then, the right? business yeah. was growing but i was just a fan of the videos and watching all the fly outfits and then going into the office i'm like oh this is how it all works mm. and comes together um, so just being a part of that, I didn't realize I was stepping into history at all. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting to see the people you worked with before and now where everyone is now. Yeah. How many people stayed in the industry, how big people got, mm-hmm. um, you know, and that you knew them before what things were yeah. like, you know? Yeah. That's it. Like hip hop, G. Yeah. I started with Latrice, mm-hmm. uh, Manuel, Shaka. I just spent the Carlene. So we, you know, Rockefeller was so, um, It was family oriented. Yeah, insular, yeah. It was a really small company at the time. And so we gained, like, we we created, like, a really tight-knit bond. Yeah. Um, 
And so Carlene, for instance, I because she was the first person I worked with going Carlene into Rockefeller. Ballin. Carlene Ballin. Um, she was, you know, uh, Damon J.M. Biggs assistant at the time, which was she a was the first job. line of defense for everybody. She that was. was for the right. For, I remember was. for the longest time. Yeah. Yes. And we just spent some time in London together. So that was great. But, yeah, we definitely all still keep in touch. May not be on a day-to-day, but, you know, anytime we need something, we're always there for each other. And it's a great, you know, just resource community to have. So after that, you bounced around. You did Atlantic. You were at different jobs. And you ended up Mm -hmm. back with Rock Nation in a different capacity, but Mm -hmm. back with The Rock, Mm -hmm. ultimately. So uh, talk a little bit about what do you do? What's your responsibility right now? What do you run What's it like and how is it different compared to the old rock days? I would say, um, so right now I'm the co-president of Rock Nation Label. Um, I oversee all the business operations um, just from a sense of like staffing, you know, maintaining, overseeing P&L, make sure the business is running. Um, And then also, you know, I'm a marketer at heart, so I never... In all of my roles, I've never fully left marketing, you know, it's really because I think it's so important for. So just to backtrack a little bit, me and Omar, right, split the role. Omar has been an A&R at heart. I've been a marketer at heart. And I've always seen those two things being like the center of breaking artists. And I always admired what Julian Craig did at Atlantic. Mm-hmm. I loved how that, you know, they had that dichotomous role. Mm-hmm. And so that was the first presentation when I started meeting with Jay and Jay Brown and Dez was, I would love to have a dichotomous role. Mm-hmm. It wasn't about me, right? It wasn't like, oh, I just want to be the president. I want to have this, you know, this power, this title. It was, how can we be most effective? Mm-hmm. And so... Because then you don't have to have one person who does it all. Exactly. You've got just two brains working on yes. it. Yes. As long as you can get along with the other brain 1000 yeah. percent mm-hmm. and knowing your strengths and knowing your weaknesses right yeah. and i although i lived in the studio as a marketer i know that i wasn't the one picking out the producer the production and you know all of those things and so um it w- I, I thought it was really important for that you know dynamic and so we really split the role that way right a and r is completely omar i still sign things if i find something that i'm really passionate right. about um, but Omar oversees that. He oversees the A&Rs and then really the rest of the business I'm overseeing from a day to day. Can you talk about some of your um, early successes upon joining a rock label? Yeah. OK, so I remember some stories. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't know if this is like the mo- what has garnered the most success, but right. these are stories that just stick in my head. Absolutely. Um, so I was at Def Jam during the L.A. Reid era and. He would have this thing called senior staff meetings. That's right. And so, oh, wait, former LA Reed employee. Absolutely. Yes, yes, I know yes, all yes, about you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But we want to hear your story. Yeah. <laughs> so he would have these things called senior staff meetings, and I. So after Rockefeller kind of like dismantled, right. I really I always tell people I had to take a step back with to move forward. I went to be Tracy Waples' assistant. And she was running um, marketing. She was the SVP of marketing um, at Def Jam at the time and kind of working under Jay's regime because yeah. um, Falana was also there as an SVP of marketing. And, and so I went to be his assistant, her assistant. And, and so I was like, re, like back in the building trying to prove myself because mm-hmm. everybody didn't know what I was doing at right. Rockefeller. You know, it was kind of like. Did I they think to- that you were nepotism because of your relationship with the dame and that you had a historical background? Or do you feel like you got respect when you deserved it? Or I- did you deal with that at all? I won't, I don't know if they thought nepotism, but I do know I was really young still. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that worked against me a little bit. It was kind of like, okay, she's, she's young. She looks young. Like, you know, can she really handle this workload? Mm -hmm. And so I started getting things because Tracy became so busy with a lot of projects. I started getting things by default. I got, which sounds crazy, but I got Nas by default. (laughs) And I also (laughs) got, um, Jadakiss. Wow. And Jadakiss, I remember he had, it was the last Kiss album. They were focused on so many big projects. I mean, it was like Mariah, Neo, Jeezy. It was like, that was the day. I mean, Def Jam was on fire at Mm -hmm. that time. And so... I started working with Jada Kiss. I remember he was saying in the beginning, he said, they gave the intern my project, right? <laughs> and I wasn't an intern at the time, but that's how he felt. Right. And 
I was like, okay, I know what I got to do with this one, you know, in my head. And he had no radio hit at the time. Mm -hmm. We were like, let's just focus on his core audience. I said, if we focus, laser focus on that audience, that audience is, they're going to show up. Mm -hmm. And I knew the power of Jadakiss. And so me, Steve and Kendall, they were best of both offices at the time. Right, we we had Steve uh, uh, as one of the podcast Mm -hmm. guests. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, we like, Formed this little team in the office. We had we were in offices with no windows, and we like we're going. This is going to be the one. Nice. And so I remember L. A. Reid because first week Jada Kiss had sold like ninety thousand records, and he's like, "Where did that come from?" Mm-hmm. You know. And so they brought me up to the senior staff meeting because I wasn't in those meetings That's at the right. time. Yeah, you had to work your way. Yes, yeah, you meetings. had to work your way into those <laughs> meetings. Excuse me. And um, they was like, "You have to take a lap," and everybody was yeah. clapping. So I remember that as being one of the moments where I was like, "Okay, L.A. Reid noticed me. I finally mm-hmm. got some, you know, outside of Jay and Damon. You yeah. know, I was starting to spread my wings, and I really enjoyed that moment. Absolutely. Yeah. What's it like now? What is your responsibility now compared to then? Do you enjoy it as much? I do. Mm-hmm. I still love it mm-hmm. as crazy as because you know is. people get jaded. Yeah, right? people say people you've had an, or and make their way out of it or mm-hmm. move on or whatever. Mm-hmm. We're talking twenty to twenty five years for you. Yes. Are you still as excited? I'm still excited because I know that I don't know everything, and I know the business is still evolving. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like even from when I started at Rock Nation five years ago to now, I'm like it's changed. Mm-hmm. You know, I have to think about it differently, and so. That, as long as I'm continuing to learn and continue to be challenged, I'm still finding my excitement. Um, it's different in a sense of, before I was just creative focused, I was like, okay, where's the billboards going? What are the photo shoots going to look like? And although I still have my hand in that to some degree, um, you know, I got to think about Money going out, money coming in. Can we spend that much? How do we be wiser? You know, it's that's not, a lot of what the job becomes, right? That's it is a the lot money. of what it's it becomes. When the higher you get it up, it becomes about the money, right? It becomes about the revenue. It becomes about staff morale, keeping people just energized. You know, um, artist relations is still very important, mm-hmm. uh, and I like to. I I've realized because I've been in major in a major label system for a, lo- a while, and then my first kind of like indie label experience was with Todd Moskowitz at Alamo. I love the smaller environments because it gives me a chance to really connect with the artists more. Um, It's harder to do in the bigger companies because there's so much more going on and we're kind of like a quality over quantity, but we can afford to do that because we're smaller, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'm able to talk to the artists when they need, you know, I'm very, I'm still very hands-on in that sense. Uh, But it is all about the, just the vision of the company. Where do we want to see it in the next five years? How do we get there being more strategic? Um, And just like thinking of everything at one time, really, uh, before it was like marketing, you know? So when you first started, um, well, a lot of us, when we first started, uh, there was no streaming, you know, with Mm -hmm. CDs and then, you know, the business evolved. Mm -hmm. How were you able to change over time and is your thinking still the same? Do you approach things differently? Mm -hmm. What is your your thought or approach when you go into signing artists, when Mm -hmm. you bring things to market Mm -hmm. um, in a business that keeps changing over time? It's a balance, I would always say, because the thought process for me is still the same. Like I still want to break legacy acts, Mm. right? And that hasn't changed. How we do it has changed a bit. Like before, you know, you didn't have to worry about the overexposure of the Internet and the fans or their communities being a part of their everyday lives and needing so much. Now I say that music needs so much more context, right, because Mm -hmm. it's you have to like have to evoke emotion. And it's Mm -hmm. almost like you have to Mm -hmm. you have to expose yourself before before the internet, right, you didn't have to give so much of yourself for people to connect with you. And so it is important to a degree that artists are out there doing the work in a different kind of way. Um, I would say we would would be able to manufacture artists a little bit more back then than we can now. Like, now it's, like, it's very see-through. Yeah. Um, And so it's important, like, especially when signing artists, 
seeing what they've done up until this point. Wow. Because it's now it's like it's a partnership. If you can't put in as much work as we are doing, then mm-hmm. I don't see it being successful right. at all. You know, and so it's really important for us to like make sure that the team that's around the artist is important. Yeah. Um, you know, before I used to be like, okay, we'll just we'll build the team around them. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll, we now we, they have the team. Now, now they need. No, I'm saying now they need to have. The now team. they need to have the team. Like, and sometimes they don't, mm-hmm. and they could be really good, but talent is not gonna just break you through anymore yeah. you know there's yeah. a lot of other factors and so i have to think about all of those things before we you know bring an artist into the fold absolutely now do you have a bigger hands up because they have a social following versus when they came in and they didn't have any how much does a having a social following with a new artist or any artist i guess matter how much do those numbers mean to you guys or do they hinder having a social following with engagement, right? Because that's also important, right, right, right? right? You can have a bunch of numbers, but it doesn't mean anything. But having a social following engagement definitely helps because then you know you have a you have a, 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 a catered audience. You have somebody that's paying attention and showing up. Um, but we've done signings where there wasn't any social following. Well, so that, it's interesting because I see a lot more signings lately and I'll go to the artists and there's less significant followings mm-hmm. than ever. And mm-hmm. you say, okay, so this is kind of like the mailman got a, a label deal or mm-hmm. something, you know, got a record mm-hmm. deal or something like this is, it feels more local than ever. Mm-hmm. Now, is that because everybody's competing to sign the same people or you're just looking at people earlier on? But why does it seem like there's, it's, you know, more tangible. It's, you know, yeah. an artist doesn't have to get as many. It's 40,000 followers versus 140,000 right. or something. I don't, I don't know. I, I can't speak to why other labels are doing it. I would say for us, like Maida, for instance, had 10,000 followers. Mm-hmm. We just thought she was amazing. And mm-hmm. we're like, we're, you know, Omar had a vision. He said, I already know what, what the records are. You know, he had a full vision and she was aligned. And so we did it. I think it's still... It's still, it's still operate. We still operate off of gut and passion to mm. some degree as well. I don't yeah. know if that's what other people are looking at when they're signing it, you know, because sometimes there's things on the back end that show you, although they have 40,000 followers, the growth is, you know, 10x in week over week. And they, you know, those are enough metrics to say from a data standpoint that we should sign it. But for us, it's, it, it has primarily been about if we love it, you know, we're going to go for it. So you're still going off your ear. We're still going off our ear. Mm-hmm. And vision, mm-hmm. you know, if we yeah. see something, if we meet somebody and we're like, okay, you have it, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that we can, we still bank on. That's good because then it means it's not so much manufactured by whatever the system is. Yeah. You know, that, that it's not TikTok driven. It's yes. not social right. driven like that, that you're still saying, hey, there's talent here Absolutely. that's what we're signing off yeah. of you know do you see social affecting the artists like we just did a story for xxl about and what we noticed a lot when we we're talking to labels is um how much social affects the artists mm-hmm. how the comments mm-hmm. hurt them how mm-hmm. many labels have had to take over running the social for the artist mm-hmm. because it just affects them so drastically mm-hmm. one way or the other mm-hmm. from seeing it is that something you deal with with artists where i mean people are mean yeah <laughs> they're yeah. gonna be mean on here yeah. they're gonna be mean to the artists and how do you deal with that for the morale of your artists when they're getting torn down yeah well definitely we see it all the time um it's one of those things, I mean, as a human being, right, it's just hard to ignore. Um, but that's where I think the artist relations yep. comes into Absolutely. play and having those relationships where if an artist is bothering them, I mean, if something's bothering an artist, they feel comfortable enough to hit us and be like, you know, they're just in the mood or something. And we try to, because I'm so aware of the effect that that has on artists, I try to be proactive in just helping them to understand how great they are, making sure they understand their plan, their long, because if anything can happen, right? Somebody could say, um, I don't know, you haven't, been, you haven't been consistent, but as long as they know what they have coming up or, you know, things like that, I think and it changes you their perception. Yeah. Yes, and we believe in them. Yeah. And so... Yeah, it definitely happens, but we definitely try to... I mean, it's something you had to fight different than the Jadakiss Project, right? Absolutely. You know, versus what you came up on and dealing with that. Absolutely. And now a whole other level of your job in the business is dealing with people's feelings in a day-to-day basis you didn't have to do Absolutely. before, right? Yeah. Do you feel like artist relations is a, a lost art? Do you feel like, do major labels, do you feel they focus on it more, or do you feel independents focus on it more, mm-hmm. or is it something you guys have to be ready by the time you get to us because we're, off, we're already off right. the races? 
Um, you know, I've been out of the major label system for so long, but I do know that there are major labels that are still operated off of people that strongly believe in that, like Julie right. and right. Craig, right? That's where they come from. Mm-hmm. So I can't see, although I'm not in that system, mm-hmm. I can't see if Cardi has an issue, you know, not being able to reach out to them or, you know, having that direct communication. Um, but I do think it's an important art. Yeah. You know, I think it's very important to... Because if you don't know your artist, yeah. then how could you really devise the right plan? How can you reach the right people, right? Because you're just shooting in the dark then. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where, you know, the business has gone a little bit, the shooting in the dark when yeah. and, and not having enough strategy and, and understanding who the artist is speaking to mm-hmm. and taking enough time to build that community, you know? And how critical is that in the developmental phase? When an artist first comes in. Which part? The, the artist relations part. Oh, it's super important mm-hmm. because it's kind of like a baby, right? You're, build, you're molding, yeah. you're helping to mold how they're going to perceive things and how they're going to show up. And so I think it's really important to be there, extra be there in the right. beginning. Um, but you also got to stay because they, they, <laughs> they evolve over time and they're going to see different things. They're going to be around different people. And so you have to keep them grounded in a sense. Um, and just rem- and, and just constantly reminding them of who they're showing up for. Because I think what happens with artists sometimes is they start seeing more and then they want to speak to the world at one time. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, let's focus on the community. Because mm-hmm. if you keep focusing on your core, that's going to build, that's going to grow you regardless. You're going to make a core, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And people are going to want to, and Jay is the blueprint of that. I mm-hmm. always talk about how, like, Jay didn't go to Lincoln Park. Lincoln Park came to him, mm-hmm. right? Like, it was just the culture he had on such a lock that people wanted to be a part of what he had going on. Yeah. And so I always think about, you know, I always try to preach that to our artists. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I wanted to just address one thing because we were talking about just going off of gut and being able to do that. that. That's a big part of having an artist that really modeled his career off of that. Right. You know, I think that's why we have the autonomy to operate that way, where we can sign things that we really believe in. And he understands the time it takes to... Mm-hmm build a superstar, right? Because mm-hmm. he was in the position himself. It's harder when you haven't been in that position. Right. So how much is Jay part of Rock Nation on a daily basis, on a weekly, on a who's signed to the roster, what's going on, mm-hmm. do you report back? What's his actual touch on the label? We, we, we bring him in um, when we're ex- like super excited about something, we have a song that we're like, Jay, you got to hear this. But he's very, very high level, right? He's overseeing not only Rock Nation label, but I mean, not overseeing it. He's over the entire company as a chairman where he has his S. Carter Enterprises, he has management, he has sports, he has. So I try to not inundate him with things. Um, he'll hit us every now and then and just ask how things are going. And then we do like quarterly meetings where we just update him. Um, but he puts a lot of trust in us. Does everybody that. try to get to him through you? Uh, people have tried. I think I've created such a, like, don't even come to me about that, please. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. where enough people know now. And, and what's great is that the level of autonomy that they've given us, the artists don't really... That's not their angle. They're not waiting for him to come. They're in the not building. waiting because yeah. we can make the decisions, you know. And they know if we say no, we're saying no, right? But Rock Nate, you signed to Rock Nation the label. You are getting the Jay Z cosign, right? Mm, you're, you're getting the cosign through being on Rock Nation, right? Okay. Right. You're getting mm-hmm. the cosign because Rock Nation is the name that you're signing to. But mm-hmm. that doesn't come automatically with okay. Now Jay has to put his arm around right. mm-hmm. you or anything get like on that. get a do give you a guess first yeah. right yeah. yes yeah but the name has meaning how, right right, right. Mm-hmm. how upset were you to see the split of Jame, dame and jay as being someone who was there for the beginning and where it is now yeah i mean it was a lot you know it was it was upsetting because it was just damon i grew up with jay you know essentially still grew up in a sense because I started at 16. Um, So it was disheartening to see it happen because we were such a family oriented, you know, it worked team. It worked. It It felt like it was all working. Yeah. 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 And it was, so it was sad to see, um, but it was, you know, it was something that 
it was a lesson, I think, for me as well. Like, okay, it's hard. You know, as much as you love what you do, you always have to remember it's a business at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I think that was the biggest lesson in it all. Yeah, and there's been a lot of those. I mean, you see that a lot of Mm -hmm. times, either with you personally and something you're involved in or other things in similar situations Mm -hmm. that it is a business. Yes. And it can't stay like something forever or whatever. Yes. Yeah. What's one of the takeaways that you'll always remember that Jay, uh, he's given you a gem? I, I would love to sound super prolific here, right? Um, but I can't remember. <laughs> I live what. by this line he gave <laughs> me, right? I say it's my mantra. You know? <laughs> I can't remember one, but what he has given me, and I really want to say, I, it has, I have to give credit to Jay, Damon, and Biggs, right. but Jay also being now where I'm currently, you know, I'm currently with him. What they have consistently given me is the strength to step in these rooms Mm -hmm. and be confident in who I am, right? Right. And be confident that um, I I deserve this Mm because they pour into me. They've poured into me. They've given me, I mean, to give me, not to say, let me not say give me because I've earned it too, right? right? I've definitely earned it. But to trust me, I should say, there you go. with these level of um, with this level of position. Well, they were the first to believe in you, right? They were the first to believe in me yeah. at sixteen, mm-hmm. right? Damon used to force me into meetings with uh, Def Jam and say, "You're running the meeting," and I'm shaking, like <laughs> shake, literally shaking, because I'm like, "What? All of these people, you know?" And it forced me to just operate in those rooms. And yep. then for Jay now, it's kind of like. Even if someone tried to come to him, he's reverting it back to me and Omar, right? right? There's no, like, it's not playing two sides of the fence. And so that, that, that encouragement does a, does a lot. Yeah. You know, it does a lot for, for me outside of Rock Nation when yeah. I have to go into different boardrooms or, you know, talk to people that maybe I've even looked up to over the years but have to have hard conversations because it's business. Right. It, just, it just gives you a different level of encouragement. To keep going. Sure. All right. So what have been, are there any particular moments that you are around historically that you can't believe you were there for? A song, a performance, an argument, a, <laughs> you know, what have been some great things that, you know, are in your... Yeah. If you um, were, if you, to, just to flex for a minute, give us, flex <laughs> on us for a little things that we didn't get to be around, but you did. She's like, Sherry's so, very she's humble. Like, so yeah. I'm like, <laughs> there's so many, but I also don't want to brag because I don't think that's her, right? It's so so it's a mix of the two. Oh, when have I been around? I know it's been so many, right? And I haven't. Uh, Jay, Summer Jam, Michael Jackson coming out and being backstage wow. for that moment, you know, and seeing that. I remember that moment because right after, I mean, this is like a random mm-hmm. memory, but right after Carlene lost, like, Jay's diamond chain or neck no like bracelet and he was like come on she's not because she was like she was like okay let me go find it and he was like let's just go she's not coming back but I remember that I don't know why I <laughs> randomly remember that but that was a cool moment um what do I, I I'm like at a loss I mean I've seen Cam Dipset you know we had that whole moment that I was like there. I was like the what fifth member or mm-hmm. sixth. What, how many? Was I it do was remember Zeke? you very much for the dips. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was all in yeah. that. Um, we had great. Yeah, moments. you were the fifth member. That when was, you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was everywhere with them. Everywhere. Um, I'm just trying to think of like. All right. What about starstruck moments for you that you were just excited to be around, even if it's outside of hip hop? Via your career, what have been things that you were just starstruck to meet this person or see this person or? Because you're allowed into rooms that most people aren't allowed into, and I'm not just rooms, venues, backstage, whatever it is, but have there been moments where you were just speechless? Okay, so this is going to sound crazy, but before, so there was a gap between when I last seen Jay and what Jay has be, had become, right, before I started interning, mm-hmm. and I was a Jay-Z fan, right? And so once I started at Rockefeller, I was like really excited to be around Jay. So when I first seen him, I was a little stuck. But other than that, 
because I was around, to me, I felt like I was around the coolest of cool, you mm-hmm. know? So it was really hard to be starstruck after that because mm-hmm. we were like, I loved everything about how Rockefeller operated. I loved how we moved, uh, you know? We, and then we would see so many different people just because of who Jay was, you know, being on his video sets or just being at shows. He had Jay-Z and Friends, you know? So... I don't know. I, I haven't. I, I didn't. So she was around that, for everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too many to remember. <laughs> yeah. I know I'm going to leave here and I'm going to be like, dang, I should have said this moment, right? But nothing's coming to me immediately. I mean, Nas, when I started working with Nas, I thought that was really cool. I was really mm-hmm. excited about that. I wasn't starstruck, but I was really excited to work with him. Yeah. And Nas was one, because he was already so legendary when I started working with him, the level of humbleness, like he was so humble and he was so appreciative. And I was like, wow, this, you know, like mm-hmm. it just, it, it shocked me. And I remember when Tracy left Def Jam, he called L.A. Reid and told him I, he, I was the only person that he wanted to work my project. So that was another moment where people started like, OK, I got to pay attention to what this girl is doing. Mm-hmm. Because too many people that have a have a voice and mm-hmm. have some power are like calling her out, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. So, looking at today's landscape, I mean, you're mentioning big names, Nas, Jay. These are huge artists. We were talking about this a little before podcast. What does it take to be a rap star these days, to be a music star? You know, are we going to see them be as big as those guys are? Are we going to see legacy acts like that? Mm -hmm. It seems like it's very, and something you might deal with 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 your um, job and your label is, here today, gone tomorrow. How can you have somebody stick around? Is that even possible? What's a modern day hip hop star? How do you approach all of that? I think it's possible. Um, I know it's a lot harder today because, you know, the business is so, it's just so many people. It's so oversaturated. Um, So it's harder to break through. But I do think, and I think it takes longer. I think it takes longer. And I think it's all about resilience. Um, And you can't be afraid. Like a lot of artists, they feel like they're being redundant. They feel like they've, oh, we already did that. I'm like, no, you have to do that a lot more Mm -hmm. to capture your core audience. I think it's really, really all about building community, building a fan base. And you have to speak to people over and over and over again. And you have to have a point of view. You have to know who you're talking to. Um, I always like challenge an artist. Who are you? What is that? What does the fan look like? What's the person's name? What are they wearing, right? Don't try to speak to a bunch of people at one time. Identify your audience, identify your fan, and really capture that, that person. And I say build there. Um, do every artist want to listen to that? No. They feel like we're pigeonholing them. And I always say that that's not the case. We just want you to have a foundation. One, a foundation to build from, but a foundation you can always fall back on. Mm-hmm. Like, you look at these R&B artists that can tour forever, mm-hmm. right? Because they didn't change their point of view. They still talking about love making, sex, and, you know, and that's what people want to hear. That's mm-hmm. what they're showing up for. And I always say, I want you to succeed beyond me. It shouldn't be contingent on a plan that we have to put together. Right. It has to be contingent on, no, your audience mm-hmm. is going to... Make us in. change the plan. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. And so I do think that there's still um, room for superstar growth, uh, and I want to see, and I am, I'm actually very laser focused on seeing superstars grow. Uh, but it has to be like, you have to have the runway. Um, and that comes from up top too, right? You have to have the runway, um, executives, owners of the corporation, they have to understand that it's not an overnight process. Right. Uh, but we think about catalog, we think about major labels, we think about what keeps the lights on in buildings, Right. 70, 75% of the business is catalog driven. If we don't continue to build sustainable artists, what's going to cover the catalog ongoing, you know? And so I think that's really, um, I think it's important for our business. In your opinion, are stars made or built? Or built or or born? Built or born. Built or born. born. I think you can have it in you. Mm -hmm. You could be born with something special, but it's got to be built around. But it has to be built around. You have to, it has to be nurtured. Yeah. You have to be serious about it. Maybe, maybe the answer is both, right? Like you're born with it, but you have to. Cultivate it. You have to cultivate it. And we've seen right. talented people get in their own way, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I see people with less talent. There sometimes you go. no yeah. talent. That's what I was getting at right yeah. there. Because <laughs> we've seen a lot of people that, you know, may not have the, 
may not be as talented musically as yeah. others, but their trajectory <laughs> is much further. Make it a lot more so, money than you, know, you right? Like, 100%. Absolutely. Yes. Hard yeah. work beats talent. There you talent. Go. What about ego? Work. Like, when we do freshmen, we see more and more, we sit with new artists and they say, I'm doing something nobody else has done before. And you're like, oh, we've seen it. <laughs> right. You know, like, it's, Inge, have you ever seen this before? No one's ever done that before. I'm the only one to ever do this before. And you're like, I've been around a long time. Mm-hmm. I've seen a lot of this before. Mm-hmm. Do you feel more ego than ever? Is that just healthy? Uh, what's the challenge? I don't feel more ego than ever. I feel like I've seen ego. You've seen it the same I've amount. Been, yeah. yeah. And maybe it's just, maybe it's more at one time, but I've seen the highest of egos, you know? <laughs> so I don't look at artists like, and I also sometimes, I think I have more grace for artists, especially young artists, because they're speaking on what they know. Mm-hmm. They don't, you know, and sometimes they haven't done the research to know that no, someone did it before them. And so, um, you know, you use those as teachable moments, but I don't ever turn my nose at them. Um, you know, have an ego, but work hard, you know, because sometimes you need the ego. You, some, you know what, Jason, what did mm-hmm. Jay say? Sometimes you need a little ego. Like, I think that is important, especially in the positions they're in. They have to think of themselves as this, like, major figure, but have, do, have the work to, to back it up. Mm-hmm. That's my thing. Traditionally, you know, rock is known for... Um, as a hip hop label, but it's much more than that. You guys have R&B acts. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys are global. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to mm-hmm. us about that. Yes, I'm glad you asked me that question mm-hmm. because I think everyone thinks immediately like it's you know a rap label. Yeah, it's much more than that. It's much more than that. Um, we have, I mean, we have we have Willow right, who mm-hmm. was an alternative rock. We actually kind of like took the time to just work with her over the course of her figuring out who she wanted to be, you right. know, who she, where she was most comfortable. Um, but we, you know, we have alternative R&B, we have ombre, um, we have R- traditional R&B, Dixon, we have rap, Rhapsody, um, and then we also have rock. Like we have this artist, Dorothy, that's amazing, that we're super excited about. Um, so we're definitely all an all genre based label um and the management side of rock is a whole different company it's a whole different thing so you're sisters but from a distance correct yes <laughs> completely separate vertical mm-hmm. but the same for management like yeah. you know people hear about the megan's the uzis big shans um but we have a rock management division um so we you know we're, we're multifaceted we're not into just one thing uh And that's something that we, you know, we were very intentional about. It's not just about uh, the genre. It's about, to me, it's more about the authenticity of the artist, right? Like, are you evoking emotion? How how can people connect with you? And if you have that, that's our metric to getting into our door, right? It's not about you having to be a rap or hip-hop artist. Gotcha. Last question for you. What are you excited Mm -hmm. about? Generic, but... Um, from our forward like, thinking, what I'm working anywhere on? you want to, which you know, I mean, buying a house next week, anything you're excited <laughs> about overall. What is Sherry excited about? Um, what am I excited about? I am, I'm definitely excited. So, you know, I started Rock, I started at Rock Nation in 2019. Um, the goal was to like just make sure we were able to create the new generation of what the label was, right? Because I didn't want to rest on the success of J. J. Cole and Rihanna. I'm like, that's cool, but what are we doing, right? What are we bringing to it? Um, How are we adding value to the name? And so we signed some things that, you know, Maida, Ombre, Kaylin. You got Ken now, right? We have Ken Ken the Man. Ken the Man, I like Ken a lot, yeah. Ken the Man, who I'm so excited about. Um, and then, you know, just also maximizing the things that were already there, like the Rhapsody, who's having a great moment mm-hmm. right now. Um, and she's just amazing. I always, I always have to say that because she is like <laughs> she such is. a pleasure to work with. She's dope. Um, but I'm excited to, we're getting over the hump now, you know, yeah. like people are starting to call us. We're getting more yeah. inbound. We're seeing the numbers grow. And so I'm really excited to just, um, see all of our hard work come to mm-hmm. fruition because it's almost like we've been quiet for five years but we haven't yeah. you know we've been yeah. working behind the curtain for a really long time and so i'm excited mm-hmm. that people are like actually starting to notice 
the things that we have going on. And you touched on it um, before, but it definitely isn't an overnight process. At all. And the mere fact that you just stated that, you know, you started in 2019 and you guys were to represent what the new face mm -hmm. uh, is mm -hmm. to become, you mm -hmm. know? So congratulations and taking you. that step forward. So Thank you. Other than that... Thank you for joining us Thank on the podcast and giving me. us a chance to talk to you. Of it was a, a pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. <laughs> uh, thank you for checking in an episode with XXL's Inside Track. We'll see you on the next one. <laughs>